Good day, friends. Welcome to another Word of God. Slight change of location. Um, springtime by the lake. Can you hear the gulls? I'm not sure. Maybe if I shut up, you can. Yes. Average folks in the afterlife, number 78. I know you're surprised. Um, I'm not. I planned it all along. Uh, part two of our discussion of God in the afterlife. And uh, interesting, uh, fairly recent book by Jeffrey Long and Paul Perry, uh, adapted from the uh, archive, online archive, Near Death Experience Research Foundation. <clears throat> When near-death experiencers encounter God, it seems that the most common word to use to describe God's appearance is light. When endy ears further describe how God appeared to them, their descriptions of God may vary. Lucia found this out for herself. She had a severe allergic reaction to medications given before surgery. She said, the last thing I heard when I was in my body was the heart monitor to give out a flat sound, like you hear in the movies when someone dies. And then she encountered God. I was in front of this being. I knew he was holy. I felt this was God appearing to me as I had always imagined him, an old man with a large beard. He had taken on this persona so that I wouldn't be afraid. I felt safe. I've never felt so safe in all my life. I never felt so safe in all my life. <clears throat> this was repeated by another end of year. Uh, appearances. I believe that a person's experience is unique to their mindset and belief system. I didn't need to see God or Jesus or a human figure because I've always understood there could be a God that was a being but not necessarily human. And um, that underlines what I've been trying to uh, get across for a while now. Your uh, expectations, whether conscious through religious education or humanist re-education or, you know, Buddhist modification or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, a little twist of New Age Lemon, um, determines to a large degree what you might see when you're out there. And, um, you know, we'll get to more of this later. <clears throat> Some other experiences of God's appearance. He was the most beautiful being I ever saw. I was enveloped in pure love and peace and well-being and a feeling I can't describe. I felt safe, a glowing love like no other. He was the big cheese. That's what I call him now. <laughs> the big cheese. I like that. It was God, a supreme being, the one. He had long white wavy hair past his shoulders. Ah, personalizing it. It was the color of that fiberglass stuff in furnace filters. It also looked softer than anything I'd ever seen. He also had a long wavy soft white beard that went down to the middle of his chest. His skin was golden bronze in color, almost like metal. He was the most beautiful being I'd ever seen. He was wearing a caftan with bell sleeves and gold embroidery around the collar, sleeves and hem. It was made of a thin, silky, flowing rayon and had a Nehru collar. It sounds sort of like the Beatles in Rishikesh in 1968. You could tell he was buff under the caftan. I was pure love, but it wasn't sexual. His eyes were a color that isn't our rainbow, human rainbow. When I looked into his eyes, all the secrets of the universe were revealed to me. Now, I'm sure some of you will think that's almost straight comedy, but that is actually some of these experience. But again, it's you're getting what you subconsciously or semi-consciously would think you're going to get or would like to get or, you know. Um, lots of people just see a light, but well, you know, we'll get to that. Here's a, a few little short ones. I became aware that I am the light also. We are also part of the light. Each soul is a part of the whole or God. Another person. I didn't see God with eyes, but God was everything and everywhere. There was no separation felt. Another one. We are all brothers and sisters under the skin, and we all exist under the hood of one God. I like that car metaphor. I was one with God or the collective soul. Father, sky, higher power, whatever label you wish to attach to it. It was perfect love. Um, in so many near-death experiences, there's much passion intensity in the encounter with God. You can see this in Michael's NDE. He was undergoing surgery at age 16 when his heart stopped. 
It was as if I had been immersed in some kind of essence or form of energy that I can only describe as the purest form of love that there is. It was wonderful, as if my soul had been blended with the soul of what we perceived to be God. There was no way to tell where I began and where I ended. I wasn't in a body. Instead, I was in, around, and part of an immense, wondrous, overwhelming sensation of love and understanding. And I was completely at ease. I knew what had taken place from a physical standpoint, but I had no worries about any of the consequences of the end of my physical life. I was in a whole different place, and it was much more wonderful, much more wonderful. I wanted to stay there. I felt utter peace, tranquility, bliss, all that stuff, all at the same time. Words simply pale in comparison to the feeling, and I can't describe how wonderful I felt to be there. Why would anyone not want to stay there? Now I feel like everyone will become one with God when their time comes. Yes. <laughs> um, certainly that can be achieved in meditation too. If, uh, as I've mentioned before, you sort of pass your way through the... Uh, you know, the lower realms, the purgatories, the heaven realms, all very tempting. And the paradise is even more tempting. And move on into the formless energy worlds. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer to call them worlds, but they're, they're areas. And they're um, suffused with a, you know, a golden light. Very beautiful and warm and womb-like in an, the enormous womb. And um, there's just a sense of perfection and... Uh, lack of desire to uh, do anything, be anyone, go anywhere. You're at one with the universe, even though there's no perceptible universe, but you're at one with it and you know you are. Um, a little bit of theology from the authors here. Many people ask, where is God at some time in their lives? After studying near-death experiences, I believe they suggest that the answer is God is everywhere. Theologians use the term omnipresence to describe this attribute of God. And, you know, I certainly do too. Omnipresence and omniscience. When you're in that, uh, that suffused golden light, you know, uh, uh, a drop of light in an ocean of light, that's what you feel. If you can put words to it at all. This is entirely consistent with the connection and unity of God with all that death experiences encounter in their NDEs. According to these reports, we have never been apart from God in our earthly lives and never will be. The profound message of end of years is that God is with us every moment, in our earthly life and in the afterlife, and that God loves everyone. Well, isn't that a relief? I wonder what all those religious fanatics think when they, uh, they don't, they, they sort of forget that God loves everyone, think, thinks he, he just loves them, because they're following the rules, the rules that they put together. So therefore, God loves them and not us. Well, they're wrong. Um, there's a couple of words about relationships. Oh, and look, the sun's coming in the window. Isn't that nice? Uh, Carol nearly died of complications of a plastic anemia, a serious disease of the bone marrow. She learned a great deal about the meaningfulness of relationships during her life review. You could call it her life review, but it was more like in-depth, you know? It was multifaceted. I experienced incidents from my life from three facets, all simultaneously. From my own point of view, from the point of view of whoever was with me, from the point of view of a witness or a watcher. Three points of view all at once. I like that. Um, one occasion I relived affected me deeply. I was in the eighth grade and me and my friends were verbally abusing one of our friends. It was cruel behavior and I was drenched in the cruelty. I experienced that secret little thrill you get when you're cleverly mean to someone. I experienced the admiration tinged with fear of the girls who were going along with me. And I experienced the humiliation and pain of the girl we were tormenting. I didn't just see her. I got to be her as she huddled next to the lockers, crying along. I was full of remorse over what I had done and over the fact that I was dead and couldn't make up for it. My mind and heart were crying out, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Carol's NDE had a happy conclusion following the life review. <laughs> Good for her. I heard a chuckle and felt a presence with me in the blackness. The presence expressed amusement over my despair and said with heart and mind, something to the effect of, you were just a kid. How bad could you have been? Then I was embraced by love with layer upon layer of compassion. And it felt like home. Like coming inside from the snow to a warm fire. The smell of good cooking and the laughter of family. I was euphoric before anything I'd felt before or anything I've felt since. So, uh, yeah, we, a lot of stuff in life reviews can be like that. Tough. 
especially if you've been a nasty SOB. Um, and, it, it, you know, there's there's many accounts of that. I'm not reading any right now, but um, there are plenty of them. Um, Jean R. Experience and uh, insights and relationships. My life review was all about my relationships with others. I felt what they felt in my relationship with them. I felt their love and also their pain and hurt from things I had done or said to them. Their hurt made me cringe and I thought, oh no, I could have done better there. But mostly I felt love. No one was judging me. I felt no disapproval, only my own reactions to it all. The feeling of unconditional love saturating me continued. I was judging myself. No one else was judging me. I was told that the earth is like a big school, a place where you can apply spiritual lessons you have learned and test yourself to see whether you can live what you already know you should do. Good point. Walking the talk. The talk that you uh, jabber about in heaven, and then you bring it to earth and you try to walk it. And let's face it, it's not that easy. Basically, the earth is a place to walk the walk and live the way it should be done. It was made clear to me that some people come to earth to work on one or more aspects of themselves, while others also come to help the world as a whole. The other side doesn't have the kind of pressures that the body imposes. Here on earth, we have to feed and clothe, provide shelter from the elements. We're under contritual pressure to make decisions that have a spiritual base. We may be taught on the other side that what we're supposed to do, but can we live it with these pressures on earth? From what I saw and heard on the other side, everything is about relationships and taking care of each other. We aren't expected to be perfect. We are expected to learn. All of our experiences in a lifetime follow some sort of pattern, and we often learn the same lessons, but in a different way and under various circumstances. And certainly, um, my experience of reincarnation that I, uh, you know, many past lives that I wrote about in the book, You Are History, um, and also studying the archives of other regressionists, um, you can see that we do learn the same lessons in different ways. Um, there's many ways to learn compassion, there's many ways to learn mercy, and uh, there's also the negative stuff. There's many ways to learn how to be ruthless. Because um, when you're going through your uh, mature soul, old soul phase, and you're providing compassion to those that are suffering, um, you have to understand the path of someone who has caused that suffering through ruthlessness or lack of compassion. And if you don't understand it, you can't really apply the proper salve to the wound. And this is important. One never one should never forget this. We have to um, you know, walk before we can run. And when you're an old soul, you run. And you run smoothly, and you run efficiently, and you run for others. When you're a young soul, you run for yourself because you want to win. And the prize at the end of the passage is you know, <laughs> just what you want. Later you find out, oh no, it's not what I want. It's what I thought I wanted. Uh, decisions, decisions. Lauren was riding a snow saucer that was being towed by a car. She struck a parked car while moving about 30 miles an hour. Extensive injuries included five skull fractures, two broken eye orbits, and a destroyed left cheekbone. Ooh. I left my body went into an aura of all white light. It was warm and peaceful, with pure love emanating through and around me. My grandfather, who had passed away early that year, appeared to me and embraced me, saying, My darling, you have a decision to make. I know the decision was whether to stay or go back. Then I had an opportunity to view my life. Everything seemed whole and complete. I knew my dog and cat would be taken care of. I was pretty much willing to go, but I had some questions I wanted answered. I asked whether there would be anything wrong with me if I chose to go back. A voice answered, no, the only thing that will show is the scar of the tracheotomy. Tracheotomy. Well, I remember this dream, the voice said. Yes, and if anyone asks you about the scar, you can share your experience. If I choose to stay, what will be cause of my death? It will show that your spinal cord was severed. If I stay, what will become of me? You will become the light. Interesting. I remembered being in the light and acknowledged the space, saying, the gift I'm being given now is to stay, but I can't accept the gift right now because my mother will grieve so greatly. I saw that if I died, every time she fell in depression, she would sink deeper because of my death. The voice came back and said, So it shall be, and what you shall receive is a blessing. 
And at that moment, I knew I was going to survive. Um, a little bit about judgment here. Unlike what many may imagine when they think of God's judgment on us, one common, we all know about the people that believe in judgment, don't we? And um, when I do retrievals in pioneer graveyards around where I live here, people that died in 1830s, 1840s, a lot of them are, uh, the souls are, they're still waiting for, they're sleeping till judgment day. And I've talked to them, you know, when I do, do the work, that um, you can be, you know, embraced by, Jesus' love right now in heaven, right now. And they don't always believe me. No, they kind of think I'm a tempter. I'm a, you know, one of those get thee behind me Satan guys. And I'm trying to tempt them into a, you know, a hollow heaven or a fake heaven or a pagan heaven or, you know, not the kind of one they want to be in. They want to wait till judgment day. So you get some of them to go up the column of light to heaven and their relatives are going, hey, come on up here, come on up here. And um, the, but others won't. And there's a lot of them hang out. And um, this Judgment Day thing is, is um, it's a nasty piece of work. And we could we could certainly do well without it. But, you know, people have belief systems and you um, they're crippled by them sometimes. It was warm and peaceful with pure love emanating all through around me. My grandfather, who had passed away earlier that year, appeared to me and embraced me and saying, My darling, you have a decision to make. I knew the decision was to whether to stay or to go back. Then I had an opportunity to view my life. Everything seemed whole and complete. I knew my dog and cat would be taken care of and I was pretty much willing to go, but I had some questions I wanted answered. I asked whether there would be anything wrong if I chose to go back, anything wrong with me. The voice answered, No. The only thing that will show is a tracheotomy. Yes, sharing the experience, we got through that. Spinal cord would be severed. That would be the evidence given. I remembered being in the light and acknowledged the space, saying the gift I'm being given is to stay, but I can't accept this gift right now because my mother will grieve so greatly. So um, back to the God does not judge. Uh, unlike what many may imagine, they may think of God's judgment on us. One common refrain we read in many EDs is the ID that God in heaven uh, is not into judgment at all. And I suppose that's God the being, God the idea, God the light. Having one near-death experience is a momentous event, but Sharon had three. Good for you, Sharon. In one of her experiences, she had important insights about judgment. I was wrapped in the rays of the sun and felt safe, secure, and peaceful like I'd never felt before. There was a beautiful garden and gorgeous music. I felt rocked and cared for like a baby. God was with me, holding me in his arms. I felt this very clearly, and his love was within every fiber of my being and every cell of my body. He was all around me. I felt his total acceptance of me with no judgment at all. He is all love, completely love, and he showered that love on me and through me. I felt complete and whole for the first time, ever. I experienced a life review which lasted only a blink of an eye. <laughs> that was a quick one. And its lesson was that we judge ourselves. God does not judge us. Agreed. Then I experienced his voice, which seemed to be infused into me, but I also heard it. The messages were very clear. What you put into the universe, you get back. Be careful about words and thoughts and actions that you put out into the universe, because they will come back to you at some point in your life. It's the old boomerang theory, right? Shh. Bang. He told me to take these messages back and share them with others. Although Sharon experienced God not as a judgment at all, she also learned that we judge ourselves, and that's why we put out into the universe, and what we put out in the universe returns to us, because it's usually some kind of criticism or judgment. This gives rise to the intriguing idea that God might serve as our judge. Nonetheless, there might be a mechanism whereby judgment is built into the universe's fabric. Could goodness and morality be more like scientific laws than we suspected? It's a fascinating idea. Hmm, I don't think I agree. I don't think anything is worn, sort of weaved into the fabric of the universe other than energy. And we take that energy with our consciousness and mold it in a whole pile of ways, whether we do it consciously or subconsciously. Or, you know, it's, again, it's all to do with belief systems that we pick up as, you know, babies, children, school-age children, teenagers, young adults, yada, yada, yada. Um, employees, citizens, you know. The whole nine yards. Um, in 
interesting little point from a person called Casper who had an allergic reaction to medication. I could see my body lying in a stretcher as the ambulance attendants worked feverishly to save my life. Um, uh, in heaven we have the privilege of seeing another person's heart as God sees it, so we can understand how someone might react differently to a situation than we would. In one scene I saw someone who was very standoffish. After looking into their heart, I saw how they had been injured spiritually and acted harshly towards others out of fear. This made it easier for me to understand that not every action from another person is about me. Sometimes it's just about them. Um, people not wanting to come back. Florine was about eight months pregnant, suffering from a complication and rapidly losing blood. All of a sudden, I was in the most beautiful place I've ever seen, looking into a beautiful stream of flowing blue water. The water was coming down off a small cliff, and when it hit the ground, it sounded like the ping of fine crystal when you hit it with your fingernail. The colours were breathtaking. No artist could make such colours. The stream was so deep it had no bottom, and even though I'm afraid of water, I knew I'd be safe if I crossed the stream. There wasn't any sound except for birds and the sound of water. I was about to cross the stream when I was engulfed by a warm and bright light that felt like arms around me. The light told me that I couldn't stay. I had much work left to do and I had to go back. I'm a stubborn person, so I argued with the light, telling it I'm not going back, I'm not going back. I even stomped my foot, even though I don't think... Here we go. Canada geese. Although maybe they don't call them Canada geese somewhere else, but that's what we call them here in Canada. After this experience, I uh, knew that God had a beautiful sense of humor because when I stomped my foot and said I didn't want to go back, that I was not going back, the light smiled at me and chuckled and said, Oh, yes, you will. And of course, I went back. Now, that's interesting. The light smiled at me. Oh, yes. Good one. Uh, Kim in nursing school, off-road motorcycle accident. I was inside a black void with a sense of floating in complete silence and stillness. I felt panicked and afraid and knew that I was dead. I thought all the things I would be able not to ever attain, graduation, career, marriage, children, and I felt surprised I'd died so young. But once I noticed the stillness and peace, I became happy and intrigued. I thought that Jesus would come and take me. Then an earthly white light appeared and I heard a voice in my head. I knew this presence was God and I felt such peace and love. Then the voice told me that my time on earth was not done and I needed to go back. I pleaded to stay. I said I was fine with being dead and I didn't want to go back. But the voice said, no, you must go. Of course, we got quite a few people that come back because they, they suddenly decide they've got a mission, you know. Like Elisa here. I never had such a spiritual and meaningful experience in all my life. It was traumatizing and mind-boggling, but I carried God with me the whole time. I realized my purpose in life that day, to live every day like it is my last, and always to let the love in my heart and soul flow freely. Good, good, uh, good for you. I realized that my life could be snatched away at any moment. I'm more, much more fragile than I thought. When I drifted in the light with God, at one point I begged him to take me with him. I told him I didn't want to go back because it was safe with him. He asked me, are you finished? Then I realized I wasn't finished. And if I went home with the Lord, my task would be incomplete. He gave me a choice to stay or go, and I chose to go back and complete my unfinished business. He reminded me of my home and the indescribable and amazing beauty behind our reality. Now pretty much every day I crave my two home because heaven is truly is my home. The earth is temporary and time is an illusion that helps us understand being human. Um, that uh, reminds me of um, remember that book by Richard Bach, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. And there's a little, uh, it's a great little book, I loved it. Um, there's something in there about uh, little bits of, uh, you know, asking advice of the uh, the uh, the prophet or the, you know, the spirit. And uh, what's the question about... Um, is is my journey over? Is my is uh, you know am I finished? And the answer is, if you're still alive, it's not done. <laughs> Pretty simple. If you're still there, it's, you're not finished yet. So you're only finished when you're finished, and it's not over till the fat lady sings, right?
Here's another lady. I was standing in front of the most exquisite and beautiful English cottage, the perfect home. Yeah, no, a lot of people like those. I've got one of those. Well, I don't got it, but you know, I live in it when I'm in the astral plane. Um, lovely spot. So it is. I learned that from the Monroe people. You know, you create a place and focus 27. That's your little spot. And it's 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 a classic little English cottage, except it's it's got um, <laughs> stuff at the back that's more like a French chateau, like mini chateau. It's all described in More Adventures in Eternity. Um, nifty little place it is too. Uh, golden light was streaming from the windows in the late dusk. I knew I was, God was in the house and I wanted to go inside to be with him. As I put my hand on the door handle, I was told, if you go in, you can't come out. You have a four-year-old son who needs you. The people on earth need to know everything that you have witnessed. They need to know that their experience is not the totality of existence, but only a part of the overall plan. I understood that my fear was an obstacle to coming to know God and his presence, not only for me, but for everyone. Yep, that's, um, you know, passing along the message, considered very important. And um, I learned that early on in my esoteric career that uh, if uh, high spirits or ascended masters or, you know, guides with uh, real knowledge pass it along to you, they're only doing it so that you'll pass it along to others. It's not just for you. And uh, when I wrote my first book, um, Eternal Life and How to Enjoy It, that was made quite plain to me. Um, you're only getting guidance here, Gerd, so that you're a writer and you'll write about this. So um, it's never just for you. Um, why people talked about leaving the afterlife, um, i.e. why would anyone choose to leave the blissful afterlife? Well, one person said... God wanted me to go back and told me my purpose was not finished on this earth. I would have children. I wanted to do God's will. I was told that God, I wanted to stay, but in my heart, his, to do his will was stronger. More stuff about unfinished tasks and, you know, uh, you know, the, the beauty behind our reality, which I think we've heard before. I'm going to make a little spot about insight and revelation, chapter 7. And we've been hearing about Lyme disease recently. It's uh, quite um, on the increase in the parts of Canada where I live. And it's quite a serious disease if it's not treated uh, quickly. And um, Lonnie, she shared, I had non-diagnosed Lyme disease for over a year. What most people don't know is that Lyme can attack your heart and simply stop it. I found this out the hard way while on a trip. She had her NDE. I asked him, what are we? How are we judged? When she say him, she meant God. And he showed me interwoven golden threads that made me, me. But I didn't exist alone. The golden energy threads extended throughout the universe and all humanity is woven together. We are all part of God's tapestry. But in between the golden threads, he leaves empty spaces. He showed me that we can fill up these empty spaces with light or darkness during our lives. We are made of God, but we are given free will. And he knows how we will spend that free will. There is no way to hide any of it. Um, but you've got the free will to do it. Um, because, you know, darkness and light, they balance out. If you, can't, if you have light, then the light just kind of floats off like a balloon. And, um, of course, that's a, a deep metaphysical argument. But um, talk to any physicists about uh, dark matter and how much of the universe is dark matter. And... Uh, how it can, uh, I think it tethers down the, the other stuff that isn't dark matter. But, you know, I'm not a physicist, so, uh, you know, nobody pays any attention to me. Um, here are some of the simple gifts of the NDE experiencers as told by those who have experienced them. These are little shorts. One, I was told why we were here and why we suffer. I was told we all have to live our, our lessons on earth for our souls to grow, like children learning new things. We suffer in order to learn how to cope with things and develop our souls. Two, afterwards I thought that most things we worry about in life are pretty petty and unimportant. Well, that's true. Uh, three, during the life review I learned that selfishness needs to be eliminated from our earthly life. Well, not when you're a young soul. When you're a young soul, you need to be selfish because you're weak and you need inner strength in some way the only to get that inner strength is to be selfish and kind of looking out for number one for several lives this is some um, this is something that you see me repeating often but it's important 
I'm not saying be selfish. Now, if you're listening to this and watching this, you're probably not in the young soul phase. But when you look back at your past lives, and you've all got them, you'll come across stuff like that. And it's important to realize that building block is as, at the bottom of the wall is as important as the uh, nice filigreed stuff at the top of the wall. And also, you know, the, uh, the vines growing over the top of the wall and the pretty flowers on top and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, oh, four, life is for living, not for impressing someone or gaining something. Five, I was very judgmental before my experience, which taught me that I had to let go of judgment and try to embrace each human being as a unique individual they are. Next one. The many things that we stress about on life on earth don't really matter. They are insignificant in the light of reality and out-of-body life. True. I learned that I hate most in others those qualities that I have in myself but can't see. Well, yeah. The uh, projection of the shadow. And um, I fit... I fit very neatly into all the areas I profess to hate in others. Love was the key to everything, acceptance and love. And of course, as you um, embrace your own shadow, you tend to see less and less of it out there in others. And um, so when we look at, up, up, with great uh, horror and being appalled at the ruthlessness and cruelty that we see in you know, the various, for example, civil wars, around the world and we think oh my god that's incredible how could they do that to each other uh, does that mean that we definitely did that in a past life or that we thought about it did it suffered it well personal exploration there's no um sort of rule book here but uh, other than you know as a young soul you're going to do a lot of stuff that you're certainly not going to do as a mature or an old soul um and i certainly think about that a lot i look at um these religious fanatics and the people that um, fight against them and uh, are victims of them and, uh, you know, uh, civil wars that are fought over the seemingly stupidest things. Um, but they're at it and they won't stop. And um, I, I, I know from my own uh, examinations that a lot of these child soldiers, they're just reborn from just being, you know, killed a little while before. They don't really go to heaven. Well, they might go for about eight seconds and then come back. But they stay in the lower astral and then they find their way into another womb. Because you know, look at all these uh, women that are, you know, the rape and stuff. There's, it's just the soldiers coming back in and recycled, you know. And uh, that's the kind of life they get. And I'm not saying any of this is right or any of it's wrong. It's just the way it happens. And we need to understand that. Um, it's uh, like a washing machine cycle. It really is. Whereas the rest of us, we're doing it in a more, obviously we're not living that life. We are living our life, we're dying, we're spending time in heaven, we're getting our shit together, we're coming back as another person. We're not spending eight days in hell and coming back right down into the next, the first womb that we can find. They just kind of float around and find, you know, there's women getting raped all over the place. As we rather not think about, but it does happen and we know it does. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's the kind of washing cycle they go through. And they get out of it eventually, but it can take quite a while. At least in, in terms of Earth time, it can take quite a while. Let me finish with something pleasant. Sandy was five years old when she developed an inflam inflammation of the brain called an encephalitis from a mosquito bite. Oh, mosquitoes. Aren't they just our best friends? In her NDE, she learned not only about a sister she never had, but also received information from her sibling's angel about the future. I died and drifted into a safe black void of comfort and ease where I felt right at home. I felt no pain and wasn't afraid. In the distance, I saw a small light that was drawing me toward it. I felt myself rushing to this light. When I got to this light, I knew it represented peace and joy, but most of all, deep, unconditional love. The light was a sparkling, glowing cloud. I heard a voice in my head and knew it was God. We never talked about God at my house. And I never went to church, but I knew it was God. And I knew this place, that this beautiful light was God and was my real home. I was surrounded by the light and one with it. It was like being scooped up and held safe by my daddy when a dog was barking at me. Only more so. Then we were joined by another smaller light. It was a girl who was about 10 years old and she looked a little like me. She recognized me and we hugged. I am your sister, she said. I was named after her grandmother, Willamette. Our parents called me Willie. They were waiting to tell you about me later when you were ready. 
We talked together without using any words. She kissed me on the head. I felt her warmth and her love. Then she told me that I had to go back to save Mother from a fire. You need to go back now, Sandy. It's very important. No, I don't want to, I said. Let me stay here with you. But she repeated gently. Mother needs you to save her from her fire. The fire. I cried and threw a temper tantrum like a little brat. I fell on the ground and sobbed and thrashed around. I could see my parents, kind of like a movie, sitting beside my hospital bed, begging me not to die. I felt very sad for them, and I still wasn't ready to give up the beauty and awesome feelings of all that was good about this place, this heaven. God chuckled at my childish antics and looked at me with great compassion. Then he pointed a finger at another light that was forming in the distance. That light became our next-door neighbour, Glenn. Glenn was a kindly old man who loved kids and invited us over to play with his dogs and give us treats. His wife, Rose, would eventually tell us all to go home, but Glenn would scold her and say, Rose, never tell Sandy she has to go. She can stay as long as she wants. But here, the light that was Glenn shouted at me, Sandy, go home, go home now. It was such a shock when he yelled at me that I stopped fighting and felt a little embarrassed about my behaviour. I quit crying and was back in my body in an instant. It turns out that the day after I went into the hospital, Glenn suddenly died of a heart attack. I learned of his death only after I'd told my story to my parents. When I told them the story, they at first called it a dream, but then I drew a picture of my angel sister. My parents were shocked and confirmed that their daughter, Willie, had died of accidental poisoning about a year before I was born. They had decided not to tell my brother or me about her until we were able to understand what life and death were about. As far as the need to rescue my mom from a fire, none of us had a clue about that. But when my mom was helping me write this, I asked her what her life would have been like if I had died. She replied, I cried for months after Willie left us. If we had lost you two, it would have been like a living hell, fire and all. Well, inspiring stuff, eh? And uh, we're running out of time here, as we always seem to do. And I'll leave you uh, as I watch the, uh, the yachts and the boats on the bay here. Not too many, three or four. And uh, seagulls whipping about. A couple of guys fishing. Some more people just standing over on the pier looking at the water. Drawn to over in the distance. And um, ponder on these things, my friends. Ponder, ponder, ponder. And um, we'll get on to something else fairly soon. Not sure what, but... Um, Lucid dreaming. I've got a feeling I'm going to do some lucid dreaming for a while. There's a lot of books on lucid dreaming. People, it happens to people all the time. Lucid dreams now. It's 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 more than just popular. It's um, I, I think it's uh, it's the next sort of NDE thing. We had a whole pile of that 20 years ago. We still have it, but now more and more people are having lucid dreams where they wake up in the morning and there's more than just a fragment. There's quite a lot. Sometimes they wake up in the middle of the night and write it all down. And I have it myself, but yeah, you know that. Um, it's not about me, it's about everyone else. So um, I think maybe we'll do a few of those. And um, until then, I wish you a fond farewell and a very happy spring. <laughs>